Uh, Daily Mail has a story on it. We've linked it up at the web page, coast to coast AM dot com. And you can you can go from there and you can see actual photographs of these metal tablets, which some people are suggesting could be the biggest find since the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they are metal books. Uh, they were supposedly found in a cave in Jordan, but there's all sorts of mystery around who has had them, why they continue to own them, uh, where they're going to go, uh, and what is ac- exactly is in them. Uh, you know, there's a story that says that one guy has had them in his family for 100 years. Somebody else says, oh, no, 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 no. I sold it to somebody and they gave it to this guy, whatever. It, it's a little hard to sort out everything about this story. But more frustrating than any of that is that right there on the pages of this um, of these metal books, these what they call codices, um, there appears to be imagery and information which pertains directly to our collective religious history of the first century in the Middle East. And it's it's tantalizingly fantastic. And one of the few people who have who's actually seen these books, who has actually looked at them, is coming up next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. So I, I kept asking myself this week, OK, I really wasn't planning on doing another show that might be tied to the Bible. But uh, what would I have felt like if somebody had offered me an opportunity to talk to the first person to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I'd be crazy not to have done that back in the 40s, and I'd be crazy not to take the conversation here with Doc, uh, with David Elkington, who is not a professor yet, is um, uh, described as a, an expert, a scholar uh, on uh, biblical archaeology and uh, ancient religious history. Would that be a fair description, David Elkington? Yes, I, I think that would uh, sum it up very nicely, actually. Um, I never expected to be involved in this discovery. My um, original expertise was actually in the origins of language um, and the acoustics of sacred places. Um, and then, of course, this discovery came up, and as soon as we saw it, we realized that we really had no choice but to do our best to try and protect it, uh, you know, however long it would take. Well, as, a, as an artist and an author and a scholar... How is it that you did – how how was it that you ended up being involved – before we talk more about the discovery, how did you end up being involved with it? Um, well, that was uh, thanks in large part to my first book, In the Name of the Gods, which came out 10 years ago. And in it, I had posited a, a, a thesis that um, – the sacred place contains within it all of the mysteries of religion and that ancient man built monuments specifically to make them resonate in such a way that when you enter them, it kind of changes your mind. Um, and when you go through those brainwave patterns, you, you actually have revealed within you the secrets of religion. Now, as a result of putting all that down in rather a complex book, um, I, I, I found myself suddenly in demand to talk about that. And the book did very, very well. And it came to the attention of a British journalist uh, who was a friend of my wife's. And uh, in September 2007, we were invited to supper one evening. And um, he said to me, look, he said, David, I've just had an email through from a, a Middle Eastern contact, and it contained some images. He said, I don't know if they're real or not, but uh, could you tell me something about them? So I actually said, yeah, fine, it's not a problem at all. We went upstairs, and when I saw these things, I was completely uh, stunned, to to put it mildly. But then, of course, um, two things happened. One, I felt quite exhilarated over something which I'd never seen the like of before, and then quickly skepticism set in because I thought, well, you know, if they've come from the Middle East, there is a likelihood they could be fake. But one thing that really, really um, took my eye immediately is the fact that these are actually in book form and they're made of metal. And the first thing I thought was that actually there is nothing else to go on. Um, If they were parchments or scrolls, I could look up the Dead Sea Scrolls, I could look up uh, Egyptian papyrus, etc. But there was nothing in history that tells you about metal books for a start. 
Well, let's leave so the that there for the moment. Let, let, hang, hang on for a second. So that that's what you saw in the email images were pictures of these metal books that are referred to as a codex or in plural codices. That's what the yeah. email images were. That's exactly it. They were very um, full of detritus, like, you know, lime scale, as if they'd just come out of a cave after a few thousand years. It was really, I mean, they were in quite a state. Um, and, but that was interesting because um, the first thing that came to mind was if they're forgeries, what are they forgeries of? Because you don't forge something that's unique. It, that's uh, the, the very first observation that was to be made. That's a really um, good point. That speaks to what you were saying of if somebody were to forge something like this, they might be more inclined to forge another scroll because people would have it in the context of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so already there'd be sort of a door in. But in a way, this would be the harder type of forgery to sell because it looks so unlike anything else with which we would be familiar. Well, that's exactly it. Um, you know, and, and Bedouin have to make a living in some way or other, but to, to forge something which um, has never been seen before seemed extremely unlikely, if not actually quite stupid. Right. Um, so I thought, well, okay, let's, um, let's see if we can get hold of one of these things and, uh, and, and see for ourselves. And so I suggested to the, 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 the friends that um, we try and get them over to the UK and see if, um, you know, there was anything in it. And I thought that would take a couple of months or so, at the very least. But within about 10 days, we had one of these things in our hand. And I have to say, when we picked it up, it was the most astonishing thing I think I've ever held in my life. I was just not prepared for quite how beautiful it really was. Did they just um, FedEx it, it to you? No, it, it came over with a with a with a, a Middle Eastern uh, personality who, okay. who was very quiet about it at first, and it was only halfway through the conversation that she pulled out this uh, um, this kind of wallet, this pouch that was around her neck, and I thought, oh gosh, what's what's going on here? Is, is she going to pull out a couple of charms or something? And in fact, she opened it up, and and there was a small metal book, and it was extremely heavy. How small? Um, you could fit it into the palm of one of your hands. Um, when if, if I compare the, if I, I give you give you a brief rundown as to the um, different sizes, some of the the books are actually the size of normal hardback books you might see for sale in your local bookshop, but right. a majority of them are very small. Um, I'd say about on average about three or four inches across, um, and all of them are sealed, and that's a very interesting uh, point in itself. So. You know, we, we looked at them and we took some scrapings from two of the books and we then took those to a laboratory both based both in here in, in England and over in Switzerland. And after a, a period of uh, eight or nine months or so, the results came through and confirmed that, in fact, they were of ancient uh, provenance, that they, they came from ancient times. And that's when the fun began. Okay, so that so the, they did a carbon dating, radiocarbon dating on the on the rust scrapings and the metal scrapings from the book. You can't really carbon date lead, um, it, okay. as you know. Oh, that's right. You can only do the living material. That's right. You can. That's right. I mean, as you know from the Superman films, lead has right. a dense, dense molecular structure. Um, so you've got to be very careful in how you approach it. But there, there are a couple of things that we noticed straight away. Um, on some of the books, they are very heavily corroded. Um, now, I had the, the great honor to go to Israel and see the full collection of lead books back in 2009. And I held them in my hands and I took forensic samples with, with a brush and you name it. And um, we saw the pitting on the surface. Now, some of the photographs that have been published in the press um, show one of the books open and you'll see little holes in the lead. Now, to see lead in that condition is extremely rare. Um, it's, and it's my, primarily as a result of all of the impurities in the original Roman lead that have burst through. They've, they've kind of begun to, over a period of 2,000 years, to crystallize and, and react chemically with the surface metal. And what's mm. happened, it's like pustules that have broken forth. And, and as they've broken forth, they've shattered the surface lead and, uh, you know, we can now tell exactly on a, on, a, on a photographic basis alone exactly what those impurities are through the, the spectra of light that, that shine through them. So 
what we have is, is a confirmation not only of their age, but the fact that the impurities in the lead point to it being of Roman, if not even more ancient origin. All right, we're talking with uh, David Elkington, who is a, uh, a scholar on um, ancient texts and uh, the origin of ancient languages, as well as um, one of the few people who has seen these metal codices. If you want to see what we have in terms of the photographs that appear to the Daily Mail, go to coasttocoastam.com. You can click onto the story under uh, tonight's show, and you can see it right there. Scroll down and see all of those pictures. Did you take any of those pictures of the uh, of the books as we see them? I did. I took the whole lot. Okay. Um, we we I took over a, a, over a two thousand photographs because we had a, a, a tiny window of opportunity, and I took over to Israel with me a, a high definition camera, and I had a five or six hour period in which I was allowed to photograph them, and so I, as, as you say over in the states, I really went for it. Yeah, um, <laughs> and you, you know, did so. You, so so you, it, you, go ahead. Sorry. No, you, no, you don't I, get the chance to do this, you know, that no. often. So you just well, you just take the opportunity, and uh, and I certainly did because well, and that know, that actually led me to my question because I would think that a lot of what we know about Israeli antiquities and about antiquities from the Middle East, they don't like them to leave the country. Would it be fair to say that this woman that brought the first metal book to you in England smuggled it out of the Middle East? Oh, definitely. There's no two ways about it. Um, the, the entire horde of books was smuggled across the border from Jordan into Israel, um, from where you know the the people concerned have been trying to sell them. Um, I can't. I've got to be honest with you. I can't blame the Bedouin for, for for trying that because he's been a very good guardian of the books. He's looked after them superbly well. Um, but you know he's he's dealing with some pretty shady people. Um, a couple of them being British, uh, who are doing their best to sell them into the black market, and we're trying to stop that. And that's part of the reason we had to announce the discovery this week was to prevent them from being sold into private hands or into the black market. Because when you look at it, um, the very fact that these are books points to them being Christian um, in the very first instance. Because the Jews and the Romans of the period didn't use the book form. They used scrolls. Now, we have a few scrolls in the collection, but a majority of these things are books. And we knew immediately that this was a fundamentally important discovery for humankind. And we thought we've got to make sure that this finds itself in a museum in Jordan so that everybody can go and see them and make up their own minds as to what they are and what they contain. I'm fascinated by this. Um, so uh, let's, again, let's pull back a little bit. So when you talked about the Bedouins, just for people who don't know, Bedouins are um, sort of nomadic, or at least traditionally nomadic, um, desert-dwelling people. They're family-oriented clans, um, and they can cross over borders in terms of their lineage and their tradition. So you have Jordanian Bedouins that would have sold this to Israeli Bedouins. Do I get that right? Exactly right. Yeah, I couldn't okay. have described it better myself. Uh, and these and, – and Bedouins, they, I mean, I, don't, it would be, I'm, I have to be careful not to sound pejorative here, but because, as you mentioned earlier, there is a, a strong tradition of, of forging biblical-era material for personal profit and having these sort of – ambiguous origins as attached to yeah. these artifacts, that it's important to say that, and I don't want to besmirch the good name of gypsies either, but there's kind of a, there's a shady sort of almost um, uh, huckster-ish aspect to this type of Bedouin transaction that makes, should make, makes mainstream academics immediately suspicious. Well, look, we live in a world where people have got to make money. And, um, you know, in capitalism, it's all about money. So right. I, I can't blame them for, for wanting to make a living. Um, it's actually um, quite a challenge to academics like myself to work out what's real and what's not. And that's right. part of the fun of the game. You know, um, I wouldn't be in this business if it wasn't um, if it was boring and not, not exciting. Oh, no, no. Um, don't, don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying that somebody doesn't have a right to make a buck. All I'm no, saying no, is, is it, it is your as your choice as an academic, as your choice of a source goes, you would much more prefer to have, say, 
a German archaeologist tripping over a hole in the ground than something that came from one Bedouin, which was attributed to another Bedouin, and nobody can exactly tell where that Bedouin got it. You know what you're, 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 t- you're giving me here? You're giving me the same story as the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is exactly what right. happened with them exactly. 40 or 50 years ago. Right. And, and but, this, is, this is one it, thing that was foremost in our minds as we went through this. We were kind of thinking, here we go again. Right. It was, um, it was very interesting. But, you know, um, we looked at the collection, and there were some forgeries in there, 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 that of which we have no doubt. They were, by comparison with the lead books, these were very, very crude. Um, I mean, for instance, hmm. there were some pomegranate-shaped um, copper pieces that had been scraped into, and they looked crude. They were too well cut, and you could see the original shining orange glow of, of, of copper beneath the, uh, huh. the verdigris, the, the green. And if you compared them with the rest, they, you just knew immediately that these were had, had been knocked up the day before or something like that, you know, in order to expand the collection. Right. But what, what we saw in terms of the lead books that we have been able to analyze is that we do indeed have something that is quite authentic, uh, because once we had actually affirmed that the lead itself was, was ancient, was old, it was at that point that I expanded the academic team to look at the iconography and the language and to discover, you know, just discover and discuss the history. Okay. And so um, if I were to guess at this, you tell me what's wrong with this. Um, you have to immediately wonder whether it was the Israeli Bedouins that decided to expand the collection by throwing in a couple of uh, obviously forged pieces, or was it the Jordanian Bedouins that were trying to pad the bottom line by selling it to the Israelis by throwing in a bunch of obvious forgeries? Which one Which one was it, do you think? It's difficult. I mean, your guess would be as good as mine on that. Okay. Um, All right. You know, but I, I, these people have, um, are, they, they're very clever at the, the, the idea of, of making antiquities. But again, we have to go back to the original question. Why forge lead books that have never been seen before? Right. Um, we, we, we got a report from the Israeli Antiquities Authority that said, oh, these are forgeries and they have factories in Jordan that make these things. Well, with the help of my Jordanian friends, I've looked throughout Jordan for these factories, and we haven't found a sign of a single one. And on top of that, for the IAA to dismiss these is quite mysterious because they haven't undertaken any analysis of the books. Um, we haven't seen them having any metal reports uh, on them or any linguistic analysis. So um, we're quite mystified by that. Um, and it seems to us that actually... What we've got here is is a slightly embarrassed um, situation where the Israeli Antiquities Authority knows these things have been smuggled across the border. And so, of course, now we're trying to work with both the IAA and the Jordanians to see a repatriation of the entire collection so that, again, the public and scholars can have access to them and make up their own minds. And that's where uh, we'll hold it for now. We're talking with David Elkington about this amazing discovery, which came out earlier this week. You can link up to it, read more, see the photos at coasttocoastam.com. We'll get back to this conversation about um, about the repatriation of these books back to Jordan. The government of Jordan wants them back, says these are these would should never have left the country. Um, we'll talk about that. And then. We'll we'll find out what do we know that's in them. What has David seen in them? Of all the photographs, all the things he's read, the images that he has seen, words. What are these books? These seventy books, these seventy metal books, and why does he think they're coming out now on coast to coast? This is Ian Punnett. I was working on my books actually on the on the porch today um I, I mentioned this to you only because uh at some point sometime later on this year i'll i'll have like an adult book actual adult book out uh but i was wrapping up uh, my second uh, children's book today too out on the porch and that'll be coming out sometime later on this summer but i wanted to throw in a plug if i could because somebody sent me an email and i meant to write back to them and i i can't find it but uh i had mentioned that in denver 
uh, you could find a copy of uh, my children's book. It, it, you could find it on Amazon and everything. But Dizzy the Mutt with the Propeller Butt was also being carried by a pet store. Uh, Cherry Creek is the name of the neighborhood in Denver. And it's, uh, the book is uh, available at Chuck and Don's Pet Food Outlet. So there you go. That was the one I had plugged before on the air. If you're in the Denver area and you're looking for fine children's literature, Think Chuck and Don's Pet Food Outlet. Uh, and I thank them for carrying it there, too, just for fun. And and the second book, Jackula the Vampire Dog, coming out sometime later on this summer. But, you know, none of them are going to be written in metal. None of them are going to be written on lead or copper. Uh, and And I'll be able to prove that I wrote all of these. The question is, who wrote the books which were discovered a few years ago, or at least publicized a few years ago, to David Elkington, who then turned around and showed them to the media through the photographs that he had taken of them. He's one of the few people in the West to have seen them, uh, and he'll talk more about what he has seen in these 70 copper and lead books, which um, are right now highly disputed, both for their origin by some people and also by uh, for their future. Uh, could they end up in private collections? Will these end up as in a public display? When will we ever know what's actually in them? And how many of these books have been opened? Which brings us back to the question of where do they tie into some of these end times prophecies about the unsealing of books this year? Coming up next on Coast to Coast, this is Ian Ponnet. David Elkington is a British scholar and an artist and an author of a book which um, sold well enough and was popular enough to link him up to this discovery as it was uh, being revealed through a friend of the British media of of 70 metal books. This was back in 2007, and, and over the course of the last three or four years, David is, was telling us he's had a chance to look at them, photograph them. So what what do you see in them? What is what is in these? How many of these books, these 70 uh, sealed books, how many of them are open and and what do you see in them? Well, first of all, what I'd like to say, just so that um, the world understands, is that um, we know this discovery to be of supreme importance for our understanding of the possible origins of Christianity and after we had performed the tests, we put together a very small but very, very eminent academic team. And because we, we're very, very concerned about making sure that this is understood properly and in the, the, the proper context, we've made sure that there is a very slow release of information very gradually that, so people can become very gradually, they can come to terms with, with what it is that, that is in these things. And because... You know, this is an extremely um, important and extremely rare discovery. The very fact that they are actually in book form says an awful lot. As I said earlier, the Jews and the Romans, they use the scroll form in order to uh, keep their documents and records. But um, we know that from the very outset of their history, Christians used books. Now, all of the books we have in the collection, I photographed over... 40 odd um, books and I've, there are various plates and tablets etc which we've taken from the hoard and we've, we've taken photographs of um, but a majority of these books are sealed and you know those that are open that we've looked at are, are really very very remarkable because not only you know do they come in book form but they actually appear like books um, as you might see them today we have we have writing but we also have illustrations and when you open them up when you finally get beyond their sheer beauty and the, 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 the sheer level of, 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 of iconography and everything else, you begin to see that actually they may well contain some rather uh, rare, if not forbidden, knowledge. Um, I can give you one aspect of that. On a lot of the books, we have the portrayal of the seven-branched Jewish candlestick called the menorah. Now, in the first century AD, the time of Jesus, the representation of this candlestick was utterly forbidden. Um, it was forbidden on pain of death. And the reason for this is that the menorah actually was to be found, the original menorah was to be found at the very center of the Temple of Jerusalem. 
In the Holy of Holies. Right inside the Holy of Holies, right inside the place where God himself was said to actually live. Live, right, where the voice of God could be heard. Exactly. And so, of course, you can understand that the um, priestly authorities were very, very uh, unwilling to allow God's furniture to be portrayed in a very uh, figurative way. So the first thing this tells you, these texts are very, very rare. And the fact that they are secret tells you that they may well have come from the temple itself. But there's something else. When we look uh, at the books, they represent the temple. We have a a, a rectangle, which is itself broken into two squares. In the square above, we have what is obviously the Holy of Holies, which is a cube-like structure at the center of the temple. But underneath that square, we have a palm tree, and the palm tree is in fruit. And when I saw that and conferred with my academic colleagues, we were completely amazed because the palm tree represents either the tree of life or the house of David, and quite often the two go together. So what you have in the fruiting palm tree is the implication that there is a seed of the house of David. And underneath that, we have two eight-pointed stars, which are indicative of the star of Bethlehem. And so what we have here is the intimation of the coming of the Messiah. And that's what makes these books really extraordinary and very profound. Hmm. So if it's the coming of the Messiah, do we think that they are pre-Jesus? They are pre... They, if they are the coming of the Messiah, this is at a time before Jesus of Nazareth had begun to preach or in the belief after the crucifixion and coming before the the second coming? Well, that's a, a very good question, because another book in the collection shows a, a first-century topographic map of Jerusalem. In other words, if you go to your Bible books, your, your, your biblical histories, and you want to see what Jerusalem looked like in the, in the days of Jesus, you, you'll see that you have the temple walls, you have the, the palace of Herod, you have the, the palace of the Roman governor, and then you have the, the Via Appia, etc., um, and, and, and so on and so forth. You know, the, 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 um, the main thoroughfares and whatever. Exactly. Right. And so on this book, we only actually discovered it a few weeks back. We've been looking at it. Um, there's a lot of detritus on it, um, so you can imagine it. Sometimes viewing these things is difficult, even when you have good high-definition images. But we have seen that just beyond the city walls, on this depiction, there is a crucifix. And it appears that a crucifixion is taking place. Now, confirmation of that comes in the fact that the cross represented is like the letter T, except it's a cattle T rather than right. the, the small T, which we're, we're very used to um, in the Christianity. Tau, right? I mean, the exactly. Yeah. Precisely it. Now, what's curious about this, of course, is we have to remember one thing. We're talking here about the very early years of Christianity. So, so there are intimations in the texts that even the forgers might not have known, in fact, cannot have known, because information in them um, has, has, has come to light only in the past few years through analysis and textual comparisons within the academic world. And they actually appear within these codices in iconographic and linguistic form. So that, again, supports the idea of verification. And, and what is curious about this representation of the, the Tower Cross, in front of it we have what must be the tomb of Jesus, And therefore, I believe that what we've got here is the beginnings of of Christian iconography, because at this stage, we don't have the symbol of the fish. We don't have the the usual representation of the cross. We've got the signs here of a new movement, a messianic movement, emerging from out of its um, parent religion, Hebrewism. And that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, We're talking with uh, David Elkington, a British scholar, artist, author, who has seen um, these 70 books known as uh, a a codex or codices in in plural, uh, most of which are still sealed, uh, but as he said, uh, pretty obvious, and especially once it's been backed up by at least some early testing, that 
These are very ancient and very likely 2,000-year-old-plus pieces of metal that were being used as the foundation of these books. Um, so what you're, if I had to hear you correctly, David, what I'm hearing is there's a lot more images than text. Picture books. Um, I think you could say that they're, they're equally balanced, actually. We've, okay. we've, we've, we've started to actually analyze the language um, uh, last at the beginning of the, the year before last. And, you know, we're, we're, we're finally realizing exactly what the language is. But, Was it um, Aramaic? No, it's not. Um, and and that's again, is another aspect of this that, that makes it very important. Um, we've discovered that the language itself is a form of Paleo-Hebrew in, in a dialect called Hasmonean. Now, oh. the, ha- the Hasmoneans, after whom yeah. the dialect is named, were the kings of Israel, um, yeah, the, or kings it goes of back Judah, to the ha- be more accurate, in the yeah, first the ha- century BC. The Hasmonean dynasty, the original builders of the, uh, the, the, the first temple, correct, or second uh, No. Temple? The Second Temple, yeah. Second yeah. Temple, the, the, okay. Before, before King Herod came along and um, <laughs> a bit of a nasty character, he did away with everybody by various right. means and then himself became King of the Jews. Right. Um, but um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I've managed to piece together quite a bit that links the iconography to the, the language. And in fact, I, I'm putting together a book which will probably be out uh, in the late summer telling the story in, a, in such a way that we'll be able to get people to go along with us and gradually understand the nature of what it is these things are beginning to tell us. Okay. Um, the, the language itself, though, we've discovered is, is also in code, which is uh, frustrating, huh. I have to say, because it's like opening a newspaper and finding it's written in a foreign language. You, right. you, you, know, you, you want to understand what it is, and, and you get a, a kind of a vague idea. But, of course... The people who, who composed these books, were, uh, they went to such pains to, to hide what must be very significant knowledge that they had to, therefore, put their own language in code. That's fascinating. Yeah, I have, that same, we, we I, have that same pro- I have that same problem whenever I read the London Times. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> same, same here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. <laughs> I, I love that idea of George Bernard Shaw's that, uh, you know, yeah. um, Americans and English, we... we, we um, Separated yeah, we, by the we, same language, yeah. <laughs> exactly right, yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, we know the language is in code because we can actually decipher parts of it. Um, and, and the parts we've been able to decipher are very interesting indeed. So, um, you know, the, the story gets more intriguing. Well, the Hasmodian thing, I guess that wouldn't be terribly surprising, but uh, it, it speaks to something you said earlier. I mean, it, it, Hebrew was a more formal language. We know that Hebrew was the language of the scholars. It would have been the language of the priestly class. It would have been something they would have written in and read, but not necessarily spoken. Aramaic was the common spoken language of the period and the place. Indeed but has, it was, yeah. Right? And Hasmonean would have been... From, Aramaic came from Syria, um, and therefore, if you, if you boil it down, you'll see that Aramaic could not be the language of the temple. Right. And it would be, you know, Aramaic and Hebrew are related in a way. And just like yeah. um, just like Hasmonean, what's interesting, you talk about this sort of proto Hebrew language is, again, if you were to fake something, if you were attempting to forge something, why would you pick an obscure language that would make it more questionable, like Hasmonean, uh, or whatever this version of this language is, why would you use that and then write it in a code which would seemingly raise a lot more eyebrows, um, you know, to the to academia than it would be to raise its credibility level? Well, this is precisely it. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, and, 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 and there are other factors as well. Um, the, the, the area in which these um, uh, finds were made... Um, my wife and I traveled there in 2009, and we went twice, in fact, to the site. And the site is uh, profoundly beautiful. But again, in, in a heavy militarized zone in northern Jordan. Um, and when you look at it again on the map, you'll see this is associated with early Christian movements. Um, there, there is a text from the first or second centuries um, which is called the Clementine Recognitions. And the Clementine Recognitions is a bit like sort of the gossip column of its time. And it tells the story of uh, St. James, 
Um, and it's fascinating because um, probably many of your listeners don't realize that um, the early figure of St. Paul um, was, was a, a fairly unpleasant character by all means. Um, uh, one day he was working for the temple authorities in Jerusalem and he came across the figure of St. James and he threw him down the temple stairs, breaking both of his legs. This led uh, the followers of James to actually go into exile from Jerusalem for a while, and Paul was soon to go in pursuit of them. And of course, it was on on that famous road um, through the cave site to Damascus that Paul had his extraordinary vision that converted him to the the, the new movement called Christianity, as it became named. So what you have here, you've got here at the the crossroads of history, you've got here a, a, a horde of books that have been verified metallically, written in a language the forgers wouldn't really have known much about unless they were scholars themselves. Um, to falsify the metal would be very, very uh, improbable, if not impossible to do, and would cost a huge amount of money because you would need nuclear conditions to corrode it in such a way. Um, and they're found in an area associated with early Christian movements. All of this points to authenticity. Um, and I, I'm afraid to say that I, I now think that what we have here is probably the major find of Christianity. Uh, it, it stands possible that it might even change our perceptions of what the religion is based on or what um, it, it may change the direction of the church if, uh, if these 70 books don't if – if they don't comport – with the New Testament texts, uh, that will be very challenging for scholars and for religious people alike. Um, do you have any hint of what might be the most challenging aspect of these books? I do. There, there's an awful lot in the text that we've been able to piece together so far. Um, and and, and, and you, first of all, you have to understand that what we have is a jigsaw puzzle, and it, it's very incomplete. So this is an early analysis. Uh, and will remain, you know, hypothetical until we know a lot more. But from what we've seen so far, it seems to us that the gospel stories are actually confirmed by what the books say, and that is very, very remarkable. We have here, you know, for instance, um, the week after next is going to be the occasion follow, um, before Easter called Palm Sunday. Yes. And on the books, we have portrayals of Palm Sunday. We have hmm. the entrance of the Messiah into Jerusalem, we have portrayals of palm branches. We have portrayals of the king and his approach to the temple, exactly as the Gospels describe it. Hmm. Uh, on top of that, we have a portrayal of the crucifixion outside the city walls, and we have the tomb of Jesus, exactly as the Gospels portray it. Hmm. And you get the feeling from the books themselves. There's been, a, there's been a lot of debate over the past 20, 30 years or so as to who this character of Jesus was. Did he even exist? Well, I can confirm now that um, there will be a lot more to come in the next few months or so. But Jesus did exist, and I would say that this is the first ever hard evidence for it. And Please furthermore, go ahead. Furthermore, what we have here is books that are made that are so beautiful you can't, you don't get the impression that they were made by people who are filled with hate and wanted to go to war with the Romans. You've got, you've got here something that is great care has been taken over. And, and they've, been, they've been made with a huge amount of love, if I can use that word. You know, zealots and revolutionaries do not create texts that, that talk about the things that we are talking about now. They do not make them with care. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Um, right. That example will just have to hold, okay? And we'll come back for that, because I want to hear an example of that. And I want to ask David Elkington whether these 70 books, these seven metal codices which have been recently revealed, uh, but not unsealed for the most part, whether they contain any more biographical information about Jesus. Uh, and then also, um, let's talk about the uh, why it is that he thinks they are just coming out now and what that tells us about our future coming up next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. 